Episode 2. There are two things that I learned from the first episode. First off, there is a ton of shit that we need to know about our corporations and how to make the most of them. Special thank you to my amazing guest, Ali Spinner, who absolutely knocked it out of the park. And that brings me to my second point. There were probably times in the first episode where I seemed a little bit lethargic compared to my guest. Thank you very much to my listeners who brought that up. I am, after all, confined to a dark room every day listening to the sound of my own voice. So today we raise the energy. It's going to get crazy in here. Actually, forget that. Let's just talk about insurance. Welcome, everyone, to the second episode of the Beyond MD podcast. Today we dive into the topic of insurance. Now, insurance policies come in a few different flavors. Today, we'll be focusing on disability insurance and life insurance. Some of the questions we hope to answer are, what rider should you consider for a disability insurance policy? What factors should you take into account when deciding how much term life insurance to buy? And finally, we will look at the bad boy in the insurance world, whole life insurance. And after gaining a deeper understanding, hopefully you can better decide whether this product is for you. And to help answer these questions, we have the father-daughter duo, Joe and Kristen Fazio. Joe Fazio is a certified financial planner who co-founded Professionals Insurance Center in 1993 and has worked in the insurance industry since 1981, longer than I've been alive. Joe has developed a unique understanding of the medical profession and focuses mainly on the financial needs of physicians. Kristen Fazio joined the family practice in 2017 after many years in the insurance industry and has dedicated her career to helping educate young medical professionals as they transition from medical school to residency. With her professional financial advisor designation, Kristen is active in providing seminars to medical schools across Ontario, and she's committed to supporting her clients from medical school through to retirement. Professionals Insurance Center is an independent brokerage office with access to many major insurance companies, allowing them to research the market for the best possible fit for its clients. And with that, here is our interview with Joe and Kristen Fazio. Joe, Kristen, welcome to the podcast. Where does this podcast find you today? Well, today we're working from our offices in Richmond Hill after working from home for for several months. It's nice to get back to a somewhat normal routine. And uh, Kristen is here as well. She'll have a couple of words. Hi there. Hi, everyone. Hey, guys. Really nice to have you both here on the show. And, you know, I'm just curious with COVID right now, all the worry, all the uncertainty, has has that created a very busy period for the both of you? In fact, it has. It's funny how uh, everyone's interest in insurance perks during periods like this when there's a lot of uncertainty and they want to make sure that they're well protected in all aspects of life, whether that be through disability, life, critical illness insurance, etc. Everyone uh, is getting summaries of their coverage, wanting to know, okay, how am I looking? Am I okay? Do I need to do anything? For so sure. it, it has been a very, very hectic period because of all this. So it's been very interesting to say the least. And that makes total sense. So because there's a lot of information to get through today, I figure we should just dive right into the questions. Absolutely. Now, new physicians and new professionals, a lot to think about when they start practice. And one of those topics is insurance policies. And one of the questions is, where do they start? There's a lot of talk about life insurance, but to me, I, I think that probably the risk of disability probably outweighs the risk of outright death. So to me, it it almost makes sense to maybe start with disability insurance. And can you maybe just walk us through what should new professionals be prioritizing first? Is disability insurance a good place to start? So you've definitely hit it right on the head. So disability insurance is probably the most prudent and pertinent that you kind of enroll in first. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's interesting because I work heavily with young medical professionals. So I go to all the universities across Ontario, and I try and educate them on making sure that they are enrolling what's most important up front. And so I know it's relatively overwhelming with so much information going around about um, life insurance and future planning, but I always try and teach everybody to take a snapshot of where you are today. So being able to identify what's most important to you right now, and that's Uh where your planning begins. So disability insurance at this point in, in a young professional's life is like you said, yes, and the most important because it's the most likely thing that will happen to them. So when you look at it statistically, I mean, one in three Canadians will become disabled at some point in their working career. 
Okay. A 35 year old has a 50% chance of being disabled longer than 90 days. Uh huh. And the odds of having a long term disability versus death for someone in the ages of 27 to 37 is 3.3 to 1. Okay. So, hands you down, go. your disability policy is where you should be starting all your planning. Okay, that's really helpful information. And now that we've kind of established that disability insurance is a good place to start, I'd like to jump into a bit more detail. Now, when I was starting off setting up my policy, I was often told that I should just strive for as high a monthly benefit as I can obtain at a reasonable cost at a relatively young age. Now, some of the factors that come into play for me are Okay, overall cost of living, mortgage, spousal income, and a figure that I was often quoted was strive for at least 60% of your after-tax monthly income. I'm wondering, are there any rules of thumb regarding this? Can you shed some light on this? Absolutely. So although it's true that acquiring coverage at a young age is prudent to lock in lower premiums, it it thereby reduces the need to add coverage at, at, at older ages when rates are higher. Right. But, but in our office, what we do is we look at, uh, we take a holistic view on this and we work with our clients to determine what they need to live on. And we take into consideration many of the things that you just referred to, like how many kids are they in private school, ages, uh, is a spouse um, uh, a professional, does she generate a decent income? So we look at all these uh, factors and we, 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 we put that into our own little formula and come up with the number. The 60% rule of thumb is common with employer paid group insurance policy. It does not really apply to self-employed professionals. In fact, insurance companies have their own table of what they're prepared to insure at various levels of income. Uh, so when you earn more money and your income starts to creep up there, the percentage yep. is below 60%. It probably gets down to like 40% or less. So bottom line is, I, you know, we, we like to insure for what you need. Um, you, know, you know, as I said, buying more than what you need initially may make sense long term. But if that's going to strain your finances today, then it's probably not such a good idea. Okay. So, so, you know, again, it's, it, it's, it's an individualized situation. We look at everyone's uh, financial picture and then we come up with a, a recommendation based on those numbers. Okay. And that makes sense. So when I was going through the process, I basically tried to make sure that my key monthly expenses were being covered and topped it up a little bit from there to ensure that I could save a bit for retirement along the way yeah. should I become disabled. That's the process I followed. And as you mentioned, this is individualized based on one's needs. It's proven, yeah. yeah. Perfect. So now if we are going to be paying for our premiums with our, our personal money, after-tax money, I'm wondering, like, should one become disabled then? The, the monthly benefit that they're going to receive, is that going to be tax-free? Yes. Personal disability insurance is paid tax-free, provided that there's no outside contribution to the premium. Okay. So what, what that means is you cannot be paying this through a corporation. So okay. keep it outside your corporation to maintain this tax-free status of that policy. So uh, very, very important. Um, if you were to bring it into a corporation, then you get into these very complicated situations called lot, late wage loss replacement plans where you have to insure other uh, members of your staff and it just gets more convoluted. So it's best just to maintain it independently outside, keep it st- uh, as a tax-free policy. Perfect. And with that, you answered my next question, and that is whether this should be held personally or through the corporation. That's perfect. Yeah. The next question I have is just regarding riders. You know, these insurance policies are often very complex, and I didn't know one rider left from right when I was signing up for my policy. But are there any specific riders that you would encourage a new professional to look into and perhaps perhaps ensure that they have uh, in their disability insurance policy? Definitely. I think this is a great question because when you're working with the right professionals, it's basically our job to sort of do all that homework for you. So just as an example, when we're working with our clients, we will look at basically every aspect of all the available disability contracts on the market and analyze like the definitions, the features, Mm -hmm. and make sure that it matches what you need to protect your career and your family life. And so one of the great things to sort of consider first is that if you're buying the right disability policy, a lot of the key features are actually already built into the contract. So things like having a recovery benefit or return to work assistance, like a lot of these features are in a high level policy. And so that's first off where we come in to sort of recommend that contract to you. Okay. But you did allude, there are three main riders that I and my dad always recommend um, that you 
consider adding as an addition to any base contract. Okay. And those three would be your future income option, uh-huh. your cost of living adjustment rider, and your own occupation rider. And okay. so I'll walk through really quickly what each of sure. those mean. Um, yep. And again, like we sort of mentioned in the beginning, all of this is very personal. So there are certain riders that are really meant for specialties and others that perhaps um, sam- someone like in family medicine, for example, may not be as needed for their protection. So okay. it's always a one-on-one when you're reviewing this. Okay. Um, but as a quick overview, sure. your future income option is what allows you to actually increase your disability policy as your career grows. So for someone, like you said, enrolling in this, in medical school, transitioning to residency, they're looking at this and saying, okay, I only have a $60,000 income. Right. I need this for what I'm, you know, making in the hundreds. And so how does Uh that sort of transfer? So this future income option allows you to increase your disability benefit to keep pace with your income without ever proving your health. Okay. So at no point down the line does the insurance company have the right to say, You know, because you were in a car accident and now you have severe back pain, you're no longer eligible for more coverage. Okay. So this secures your ability to get up to $25,000 per month of coverage Mm -hmm. without ever proving any health requirements, which is so important because if you didn't have a provider, if you wanted to buy more coverage, then again, you run the risk of the insurance company actually declining you. Okay. So that to us is first and foremost, the most important feature that you add on. Perfect. The second is your cost of living adjustment. This one's quite simple. It is, works as uh, similarly to way, the way your future income option works, but it works when you're actually on claim. Mm-hmm. So this, again, very important when you're young and early in your career, because you have a huge opportunity ahead of you. You have you know, anywhere from 30 to 40 years that you'll be in this career. And uh-huh. what you want to make sure is if you're ever on a long-term claim, so a claim longer than 12 months, that your disability benefit will actually keep up with inflation so that your dollar value today will actually right. be relevant you know, in 10 years from now, if you're still uh-huh. on a claim. So the way that most contracts work is they will match the index anywhere from 2% to 10% type idea. Okay, interesting. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of like, it works like a future income option, but instead of while you're working, it's while you're on claim. Perfect. And last is your own occupation. This one is where it's sort of unique to what you are specialized in. And so at our office, we usually recommend anybody in a specialty should consider getting this rider. Anyone sort of in family medicine or psychiatry, it's probably not as valuable. Still something they can consider adding on, but perhaps um, if we talk about it one-on-one, it doesn't really fit their needs. Okay. So your own occupation, how it works is that the standard disability contract, it states that if you were ever unable to perform the essential tasks of your job and you were not working elsewhere, then you would receive your full disability benefit. When you add the own occupation rider on, it changes the definition to now read if you are unable to perform the essential tasks of your job. Okay. And it removes you working elsewhere. Okay. So what it allows you to do is if you can, for whatever reason, no longer work in your specific medical field, but you can now return and be, for example, like a realtor, your income that you're generating as a realtor would not yep. reduce your disability benefit. So you'd receive right. your full disability benefit in addition to that new salary or income. Okay. The kind of tricky part to the way this definition works is that if the duties that you're performing are any bit related, then it wouldn't count as a new occupation. And this is where, for example, family medicine or psychiatry perhaps are a bit more desk based where Mm -hmm. they're taking notes, they're doing, you know, light exams and the sort of job duties might be interchangeable with another job. Okay. When you have somebody like a specialist who is, you know, dedicated to needing their ability to use their hands that is very specific to that job and probably not going to be a job quality of another job that you're going to perhaps take up in the future. Could you not be a specialist? So those are the three main riders that someone should consider when they're buying a policy. Kristen, that is really, really helpful information. Uh, I wish I had some more of that when I was signing up for my policies, but I think I did okay. I think I did okay. Good, good. (laughs) All right. That's a great discussion on disability insurance. And I'd like to just jump ship now to life insurance. And let's begin with term life. And I want to propose a scenario here that could apply to any professional. And for the sake of this example, let's just talk about a physician. Let's say that one is a physician in training, a resident, and one already has a significant other and children. Is this maybe the right time to just bite the bullet and consider getting a term life insurance policy, given that one already has dependents to look after and one would probably be able to lock in some lower rates given their young age? I'm just wondering what your advice might be in this situation. 
That's a really great question. And it's actually great that we're addressing it because I get asked this a lot. So like uh-huh. I said, I specialize in working with young medical professionals in that transition period. And so much information is being passed around and you're comparing yourself to what other classmates are doing. And again, I always remind people that all of this insurance and financial planning is specific to you and your situation. And so there are going to be some students that only get disability insurance because they don't have dependents, they don't have large debt, maybe they, you know, they haven't even purchased a house yet. And that makes sense for them. But we always say you want to look at your full picture at the time that you are evaluating your needs. And so if you do have a spouse and kids, it's not so much at looking at, you know, can I lock in a lower rate? I look at it more and explain to my clients that if something happened to you tomorrow, what would happen to your family? And if you can wake up the next day and say, oh my gosh, like they would be in a really bad situation if I passed away, Mm -hmm. that's the trigger for needing life insurance. Okay. And so I would say about 10% of our client base on average will buy both disability and life insurance at the same time, Mm -hmm. because exactly like you said, they have spouses, they have kids, they've bought a house and there's a need for it. When you're looking at kind of buying it when you're younger, when it comes to life insurance, the rates don't fluctuate as rapidly as a disability policy. So okay. somebody buying it, you know, starting into residency, you can get a, a term 10 policy for a million dollars and it would cost you like $27 a month. Like it's wow. quite affordable, yeah. um, but it should be more looked at from the position of protecting yourself and, you know, securing against risk yep. than the idea of the rate locking it in kind of thing. Yeah, Kristen, I think that's a really good discussion because you're helping to remind us that insurance is for the individual and one size doesn't necessarily fit all. And I definitely agree with all of that. So just taking this one step further, let's say one is opting to sign up for a term life policy and one has to decide, well, how much coverage do I go for? So, I mean, the factors that come to mind for me are if something was to happen to me, uh, what would I want coverage for? Well, I, I'd certainly want to cover the house. I would want to make sure that the kids have a good uh, university education. And then I'd want to make sure that the day-to-day was covered for my wife. And I'd also want to enable a smooth retirement for her. But I can tell you that when I was going through the process, I was often reminded that, listen, you should strive to cover a certain multiple of your income because you want to protect your income. And that multiple was often in the range of six to seven times to 10 times income. And I, I can understand that reasoning, but for me, I, I'm just wondering how much of a priority that is. So perhaps we can speak about the factors that we need to take into account when deciding for the amount of coverage in our term life policy. Absolutely. Yeah. And you're, you're on the right uh, path there with your, your thoughts. I mean, when we look at life insurance and the amount that's required, um, to, to suggest to someone that 10 times your earnings is, is a rule of thumb that you should follow is totally inaccurate. Uh, everyone has different levels of debt. Everyone has different family structures. So there's so many different components to this that we have to sort of break it down and determine what's best for that individual. So uh, getting back to what you said, what I look at personally when I'm when I'm assessing a, a, a situation, I look at total amount of debt, which is mortgage, line of credit, any other debts, credit card debts, et cetera. We try to really anticipate educational funding. We look mm-hmm. at final expenses. And then the key part that I sort of uh, look at and differentiate myself from others, I look at a goal of replacing income. Yep. So in other words, if the the deceased individual is contributing, I don't know, $20,000 a month to the family household, but we want to protect 10 of it because now we don't need as much, but we need to have at least $10,000 per month to continue on while that person's not with us. So what we try to do, is determine how much capital will be required to produce a $10,000 per month income. Right. So, so that gives me uh, a number of factors that we add together. So we need the capital needed to generate an income. We look yep. at the total debt picture. We look at educational costs, final expenses. We all add all this up. Now, from that, what we have to do, to be fair, we have to deduct assets because mm-hmm. that's part of your insurance. Mm-hmm. So you may have a corporation with a million dollars in it. Well, at the end of the day, that million dollars is your little hedge, your little insurance policy as well. So we subtract from that total number uh, the amount of assets that you have that can be converted into cash. I I tend to suggest that that not touching the non-registered investment or only non-registered investment, not registered, 
because obviously registered investments will be needed for retirement purposes, right? So we want to continue on that strategy. Yep. And, and then from that number, we would subtract any other insurance contracts that are in place. And, uh, and then we come up with a final target number that we should be looking at. So, and it's variable. I mean, it's, in some cases I've seen it where it's only like two times income and others where it's closer to 10. So it's, it's, it all depends. And, but I think you're right. We have to look at, at, at the whole picture and determine what that person needs. Yeah, Joe, I think that's a really good summary. I mean, I think you've given a very thorough and objective summary of all the factors that need to be taken into account when one is deciding, hey, how much coverage do I need for my term life insurance policy? All right, so term life, not too complicated. Now, you made it seem pretty easy with your nice synopsis. Now let's move over to whole life insurance. And rather than me confuse our listeners about this product, why don't you sum up whole life insurance and speak to me as if I had no idea about what whole life insurance involves. This is whole life insurance for dummies. The floor is yours. All right, so this is a fun, fun topic. It's, uh, it is complicated. But I think to sort of simplify the approach, what I want to do is sort of break down life insurance into the four main categories that we deal with, you know, every day. Yep. We already touched on one, which is term insurance. So term insurance is, is very, very uh, specific. It's a low cost. Uh, we call it temporary insurance because it's designed to meet the family and financial obligations that tend to diminish over time. Yep. Pre- premiums are low and a lot allows you to buy large volume. So. Uh, there is no cash value with a term insurance contract. Mm-hmm. It simply pays in the event of death. So premiums do escalate on term insurance contracts, and they escalate based on the duration chosen. So in other words, if you pick a 10-year term, that means your cost will increase every 10 years, okay. 20 years, every 20 years. The, the, the good thing today, though, that is, is new, like I've been in this business for a while, um, we have term insurance policies that have durations of 10 to 40 years. So... If you're 30 years old and you want to buy a policy that's going to guarantee the cost all the way through eight to, to age 70, you can do that, mm-hmm. which is which allows for some really strategic planning in terms of, okay, my mortgage is a 25-year term. I'm going to buy a 25-year uh, uh, life insurance policy earmarked for that mortgage. And then yep. you buy other for your kids, et cetera. So term insurance policies are great for young families that have substantial needs. So that's term insurance, a very simple product. Uh, Always look for a reasonably cost, you know, large uh, insurance company that offers the product. Uh, I wouldn't go go to the cheapest necess- necessarily, but look at, at a decent contract. Okay. Uh, we move to the next category, which is called Term 100. So what's a Term 100 policy? Well, Term 100 policy is it's essentially a, a term insurance contract that has guaranteed level cost of insurance through to age 100. So you're assured that the, the premiums will never change. It's locked in all the way through to age 100. Okay. So the, the, they tend not to have uh, cash surrender values. There might be one or two out there that do, but most do not have a cash surrender value. Um, and really, in, at the end of the day, this is the most basic form of permanent insurance. So where this is uh, useful is where a person wants to guarantee and ensure that they have enough coverage to fund final expenses. Okay. So you have someone who's, you know, maybe doesn't have a lot of assets, but they want, uh, they don't want to leave a, a burden on their family for final uh, expense uh, costs. So essentially, this is an ideal fit for that market. Mm-hmm. Now we get to the last two products, which is where we get complicated. So we have the whole life participating policies and universal life policies. Mm-hmm. Both these types of policies are really, really uh, um, important for estate planning issues. And when they're designed properly, on a joint last to die format. What that means is we insure husband and wife under one contract where the death benefit is paid on the final death. Uh, It really uh, helps to create a a very sizable estate and to eliminate, or not eliminate, but to mitigate taxes on the estate. Right. So oftentimes we get asked, okay, what's the main difference between participating uh, life insurance and universal life? Well, The main difference is participating policies, they bundle the insurance charges and investment component into one premium. Okay. You you don't have a choice in selecting, I want to pay X dollars. No, you don't do that. The other thing that distinguishes it from universal life is that the investment decisions are made for you. There's an investment team that manages what we call a PAR account, a participating account. Okay. So in this account, they hold on to probably 40 to 50% bonds, uh, 
maybe 15 to 20% equities, uh, mortgages, private placements, and other types of investments. So they have a team and they run it much like a pension plan where they're always monitoring it. So these are conservative plans. Um, okay. They've paid dividends annually since day one. They've never missed paying a dividend. Very, very consistent. Okay. So the, the top players today, like there's a couple of companies that are currently still paying 6.25%. That sounds good. So a dividend. So um, how the dividend is declared as a board of directors meets every year. Yep. And they, re they review a number of factors. So a dividend in the insurance world is completely different from a dividend in the investment world. In, okay. the, in, the, in the insurance world, they look at four components and they are investments. How do we do? Do we make money on our investments? Okay. Expenses. Do we manage our expenses? Okay. Uh, mortality. Do we pay out a lot of claims or did we mitigate claims? How, how did that work? And then persistency. So they look at uh, how many policies have lapsed and how much of that premium can be used to fund uh, the policies that are currently in effect. So, so that's what a dividend is uh, in terms of how it's declared. Now, what does a dividend actually do? So when the insurance company says, okay, well, this year we've got a 6.25% dividend. Yep. Well, there's a number of different choices you have in, in determining where that dividend goes, but most often it's used to do what we call buy paid up additions. Okay. So what's a paid up addition? So you say, let's say you start off with a million dollar policy. Yep. And now they say, well, we have a six and a half percent dividend. Uh, that year, that following year, they're going to increase the life insurance policy by uh, an equal amount to that dividend. So it could be perhaps adding $50,000 of life insurance. Okay. So each, each dividend buys you additional life insurance. Okay. And so that's how you have a growing, escalating death benefit. So by the time the policy matures or pays out, perhaps it started off at a million dollars, but it may end up being two and a half to $3 million when it's said and done. Got it. And that's by way of dividends. They keep on escalating. So that is sort of the way the participating contracts uh, work. Um, now, Universal Life, on the other hand, it's completely the opposite. It unbundles the premium. So you know what the cost of insurance is, which yep. is usually referred to as the minimum premium, and it allows you to contribute up to a maximum premium. Okay. So, so the premium that you deposit in excess of the minimum rate mm -hmm. uh, is invested at your discretion into various investment options that are available within the policy. And they tend to be mostly like mutual funds, uh, index linked accounts, managed portfolios, et cetera. Okay. So the, the downside with the universal life policy is that the policy will react exactly like the indices do. So if the markets are way up today, well, then you've had a good day. Your, your policy account value is up. If they're down, you're going to be down as well. Uh -huh. so, so because of this, it requires a more hands-on approach where you want to continue to monitor your investments and, and adjust the allocation as needed, and uh, just keep your eye on it. It's not like the participating policy where you just put the money in and let uh, investment experts deal with it on your behalf. Okay. So that, in a nutshell, is sort of the difference between the UL Universal Life Policy and participating policy. And um, you know, there's 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 value in those contracts for long-term planning, estate planning. And I guess if you have other questions, we could certainly jump into those. For sure. And first off, Joe, that's a really great summary on a very complex topic, which is exactly why I wanted you to talk about it rather than myself. A lot of information there, which we're going to start to unpack now. And let's just start with the basics. I think most of our listeners probably have some understanding that the whole life participating policy and the universal life policy are both products that are essentially hybrid products. And they have an insurance component and also a cash value or investment component. And I think the question then becomes, well, under what circumstances would these products be useful for a professional? For me, a few things that come to mind are if one has a child with special needs who may require some financial assistance after a retirement, after death, then for sure, I, I can see the value. Or for somebody who has a more elaborate, complex estate comprised of multiple small businesses or a real estate empire where there's a lot of revenue generation coming into the corporation, and one needs to figure out what to do with that money. Or it could be as simple as any small business owner with a corporation. But perhaps we can talk about some of the scenarios where these policies would be useful. Absolutely. Uh, the child um, uh, situation is, I've had a number of my clients who have disabled children. 
and they have a fear of you know of, you know when they're not here that there's not going to be enough assets to support them so they buy life insurance policies earmarked specifically for the care of the disabled child so that is one important use of this contract um, and and with the, the, the corporate situation, it doesn't have to be a, co- a complex corporation. It, even a medical professional corporation will run yep. into some tax issues. So, you know, if it's if you, the planning is not done properly, a, a physician can be exposed to double tax in their corporation. So, and that's where it gets a bit tricky. You have to be really, really careful. So if you're really accumulating a lot of value in the corporation and uh, you're hoping to pass a lot of the assets to your family, the government may have a different opinion about that. And they may want to say, we're your partner here, buddy. Yep. So they want to take a good chunk of your estate. So how does that work? Well, when you buy a joint lasted eye policy, whether it's universal life or participating life, we insure spouses under one contract. Mm-hmm. Um, when spouse A passes away, nothing happens. So the policy still continues. But yep. All assets owned by spouse A move over to spouse B, with, with minimal, if any, tax consequences. Okay. Well, but when spouse B passes away, two things happen. You have to file a terminal return for spouse B, and then you have to disperse the assets that are uh, located within the corporation. They have mm-hmm. to flow out to the, to the family. So there's a tax one is on the terminal return because they ask you, well, what is the fair market value of all assets that you own mm-hmm. at one minute prior to death? So... The, whole, the holding company or the medicine professional corporation, whichever it is at that stage of life, yep. uh, is an asset. And you say, well, what is, what is your um, fair market value of the corporation? Well, it's X, Y, Z dollars, right? So, and uh, they'll ask you, okay, what is the adjusted cost base? What did you pay to acquire that? Well, probably not much because you built it from nothing. So that means whatever sits in the corporation, there could be a tax hit on the capital gain right. within within uh, that corporation. So that's tax one that's paid on the term of return. The okay. problem is the, the money still sits inside the corporation. It hasn't been paid out to the kids yet. So when gotcha. that, that's paid out as a regular dividend, there's a dividend tax to pay. Okay, gotcha. So, so, so those, those are the two possibilities. I mean, there are some planning mechanisms that you could work around that. Okay. And ins- insurance is one of the things that they use to help mitigate the tax on, in that event. So because the life insurance policy, what we say is, well, you, you have all this, if you have surplus capital in your corporation and you don't need that money, but you're, you're investing and you still have a bit left over and you move some of that premium dollar, you move some of those dollars to a premium for life insurance. Well, what you're doing is you're shifting assets from the taxable side of your corporate ledger to the tax-free side of your ledger. Yeah, that can be helpful. So, so it, it can be used for, like you said, uh, small businesses and supporting disabled children. Absolutely perfect perfect use okay now i i've always found uh these pol- i've always found that these policies are somewhat a polarizing topic because i have some people some colleagues who just swear by them and other people who are quite nervous and obviously take a lot of time to decide whether to enroll but uh, and part of that i think is the the cost associated with them the monthly premium is a lot higher than term life and i'm wondering is there a minimum monthly premium that one can expect i've heard of some people paying as little as you know, one or two thousand a month. Other people paying eight to ten thousand a month in premiums, or is there a sweet spot? Can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, it depends. Again, if you're buying a, a par policy, uh, uh, usually what they do, uh, planners out there, they say, well, if you've got fifty thousand dollars of uh, surplus in your corporation, it lets us move fifty thousand dollars into the policy. Mm-hmm. So it's really not given any thought to a minimum premium, but rather, what can the corporation afford? Um, so that's on a par policy. You don't have a, it's whatever that you buy with 50,000 is what you're going to get on a universal life policy. The same thing would apply, but you do have a choice between a minimum and a maximum premium. Okay. So, so you do, you can select because a universal life policy is a lot more flexible than a par policy. So it, it allows you to start off at a minimum rate. Yep. And then as, as you or have extra surplus in your in your corporation one year, you could dump in up to a maximum premium. So there are some limitations uh, that you have to be aware of. Like there's a few rules that you have to follow, but it's way more flexible than a par policy. So, okay. but at, at the end of the day, I, I think what they try to do is they, uh, you know, they, they just try to come up with a number, a premium dollar number that will accommodate your, your, your corporation. That makes sense. 
So really, it's what, it's what you're comfortable with. So yeah, so some that person that was paying one to two thousand, that's all that they wanted to spend, and that's was fair, and it you know get them a lot less in terms of uh, face value life insurance. But um, you know, the person paying eight to ten thousand is going to get a lot more, a lot more coverage. Okay, so you just highlighted one of the key differences between the whole life participating policy or the PAR policy and the universal life policy in the sense that the latter offers more flexibility in terms of contribution. So if one's financial picture changes and there are more funds in the corporation, which is a good problem to have, then if there's a desire to do so, one could move some of that money into the universal life policy. And, and this brings me to my next point. I think there's often some hesitation uh, for professionals to pursue these insurance policies because there's a often a widespread belief that they are, are not flexible. So you already touched on one way in which the universal life policy offers uh, some flexibility. And many people also believe that, hey, listen, if I'm going to be putting in thousands of dollars every month, essentially equivalent to my mortgage, into a life insurance policy, then I should have the ability to decide where that money is being invested. So just kind of remind us again that the universal life policy offers some of that flexibility in choosing your investments, whereas the PAR policies do not, correct? Yes, with universal life, 100%. PAR policies, no. We have okay. no, no choice at all. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Now, after doing some reading and talking to a few people, uh, some some seem to mention that for the the cash portion of the account, that it it can often take some time for that portion to actually generate some positive returns. Some of the numbers that were thrown at me were, you know, maybe it can take 10 to 15 years. I'm wondering, based on your knowledge and your experience, is this true? And if so, why is this the case? Um, yeah, it, it depends on the product chosen. Okay, once you get once you sort of dig down into uh, part participating policies. There's two two versions of it. One is called an estate creator. The other is called a wealth creator. Okay. So they both have different objectives. The estate creator focuses on providing more assets at the far end as opposed to early on in the contract. Okay. Whereas the wealth accumulator tries to build cash values early on in the policy, and they're meant for business people who need to access that cash for business purposes early on. So if you look at the estate creator, uh, it will probably take, you know, a good 10 years before you start seeing positive cash flow. Okay. Uh, um, and part of the reason is that it doesn't matter what insurance contract you buy. Most contracts out there, the break even point for insurance companies is about seven to eight years. Okay. And, and that's just to basically deal with all the acquisition costs and so on, the underwriting, the expenses of the, of the okay. employees, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a seven to eight year break even point. And so you'll see, uh, like a lag there, and that's part of the reason for it. So it takes 10 to 15 years to start generating those positive returns, yes. Okay, let's take the topic of returns a little bit further. So I'd like to propose a two-part question here. So first part is, and I suppose the first part applies more to the PAR policies, but with these policies, is there any guaranteed return that one can expect? And then part two, what's a reasonable expected return on an annual basis over the lifetime of a policy? I've heard numbers like 4 to 5%. Is this accurate? And how might this compare to the returns that one would expect through a moderate risk equity portfolio? Let's just assume 6% for the latter. So just looking for a little bit more information on what kind of returns we can expect. Okay, well, with uni- uh, with universal life and par policies, no guarantees. So there's no guaranteed expected rate of return. Okay. It's, it's whatever um, the markets uh, and what, what you're invested in is whatever they produce that is what you're going to get on a universal life. A part policy is dependent on the the dividend declared annually. So historically, they've always paid a dividend. dividend. Mm -hmm. Uh, The dividend rate has been coming down, uh, quite frankly, because interest interest rates are low. Insurance companies do not like low interest rates because a lot of their products are predicated on uh, assumptions based on expected return. And right now, the bond market is, is is not really attractive. So they're, you know, they're really, really tight in terms of coming up with uh, different yield strategies. So the bottom line is uh, the, 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 the current dividend scale has been reducing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, to tell you what's going to happen five, 10 years from now, I, I don't have an answer to that. I mean, based on, you know, obviously the huge deficits that we're accumulating with COVID and so on, interest rates are likely to stay low for a while, right. which will probably be a negative. But 
uh, on the universal life side, because you have the ability to select uh, different uh, options, like uh, there's a company out there with over 200 investment options. And to give you an idea, some of them in the last five years, if you were invested in one of the NASDAQ or tech yep. indexes, yep. You'd, be, you'd be getting 20% returns. Right. Uh, on the other hand, if you went into oil and gas, you'd be minus 8%. Right. So really, you know, I mean, you can probably carve out uh, a reasonable return in the universal life policy by diversifying your holdings and just, you know, making sure that, you know, you, you cover a lot of different uh, bases in terms of uh, global markets, uh, domestic markets, and so on. So you can do a really good job with the universal life product and, and diversifying yourself and hoping to get the 4 or 5%. Because they've got these managed portfolios as well when they take some of that work uh, off your hands and they'll do all that for you. And they are delivering 5 6% on average. Okay. They're, they're reasonable, but okay. it's not guaranteed. Not guaranteed at all. Okay. No guarantees in life, right? As, no, as they always no. say. Yeah. <laughs> So, okay, let's just look at that, the, the cash value in the policy a little bit more closely. And let's say, you know, a financial need comes up, one needs to borrow from that, that cash value. I'm assuming that when you borrow the money, that that is tax free, but not necessarily interest free. Is that correct? That's 100% correct. Uh, in terms of the um, interest part, um, there will be an interest charge. But um, surprisingly, a lot of people may not be aware, but there could be a tax on the loan as well, because it could be viewed as a disposition. Okay. So there might be some tax, depending on what stage you are with your policy, the amount of the loan, the adjusted cost base, so a number of factors that they look at. So that might be viewed as a disposition of the policy. So that's if you borrow the money directly from the policy, from the insurance company. Okay. And so there's, there's another way to create a loan, and I'll get to that in a second. But um, so what, what you want to do is um, you want to ensure that there's enough cash values in the policy. You want to make sure that it's well funded. And then if you have to borrow the monies, obviously, you're going to go to the insurance company and ask yep. you know, what, what your options are. Now, the other approach is, uh, is, is using the policy as collateral. You take it to a bank, and they will loan you money based on the uh, strength of the policy. Okay. So in other words, the amount of cash value. Okay. So if, if they if they feel that there's sufficient funds there and they could create a, a loan strategy for you, they will. Um, there's a bit of a problem with both of these concepts, though, because if it's a corporately owned policy, then the corporation is, in fact, taking out the loan. So the corporation receives the money and the corporation will have to pay the shareholder a dividend. Right. So it diminishes the value further. No free rides here. When you, do, when you take out a loan. So you got to be careful. About, I know a lot of it's being marketed as, you know, put a ton of money into these policies and then, you know, leverage it when you're retiring and take the money out and so on. And don't, you, all you do is um, uh, allow the interest to capitalize so it's paid off on death. Yeah. So the, the, the debt balance yeah. keeps on growing and then it's wiped out on death. But you got to be careful with that. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of things that could change. And I think one of the things that concerns me is the government's appetite for taxes. Right. I, I think there'll be a greater propensity going forward to start shutting more loopholes. And uh, this could be viewed as a strategy meant for the wealthy. Hmm. And the government doesn't like that. So I think that they there could be. Uh, I, I'm just that's my position on it. But who, who knows? I'd rather not take a risk and say my strategy is simply to. Um, use a policy as a, a loan strategy. So, Yeah, I think it's definitely challenging to try and make, wave our magic wand and predict what's going to happen down the road. But I will say that I also agree that many people out there will share in your line of thinking that especially in this COVID environment, taxes are bound to escalate at some point in the near future. Okay, so now that we've picked away at whole life insurance for a little bit and gained a bit of a deeper understanding, one may start to think, is this product right for me? And I think there are a few ways to go about it. One approach I find to be a bit more balanced, and that is simply to view whole life and universal life as a way to diversify money. So this is in addition to the RRSP, the TFSA, and the corporate investing account. Another approach, which I personally find a little bit more extreme, is to just say, okay, I'm going to dump as much money as possible into the whole life account in an effort to shelter funds from taxes. While that's partially true, I, I find it to be a little bit more extreme. 
So I tend to adhere more to the former approach and view whole life as a way to diversify money if one has the means to do so. And I'm just wondering, do you agree with this? I do. I, I don't like to put all my eggs in one basket. I have, I like to have lots of baskets working for me. And so life insurance is one of those baskets in the corporation. Okay. And, and, there, and the way I look at it, I, I look at this as a, as an efficient um, estate transfer, a tax efficient way of, of transferring your estate to the next generation. There's so few ways of transferring funds from this generation to the next. There's, there's not much available other than a principal residence. Um, life insurance is next in line. And so it allows you to move money tax efficiently to, to your kids. So, uh, you know, I agree with your approach. I would see, like I would still take advantage of the RSP, TFSA, do all those things. And if you have some, some extra funds remaining, then you would consider, you should consider adding a either universal life or participating policy into your corporation. Um, it will deliver, uh, good results on the far end on, on the second death. It could probably multiply the amount of value that's going out to the kids. Uh, and I've seen situations where it's like three and a half times the value. If you had left that money, just in the, in the okay. normal avenues within the corporation investment pool. Wow. So it can, it can give, it can leverage into a, a, you know, money, but it's not for you. It's for the kids. So right. That's right. A tax efficient way to transfer to the next generation. That is a really nice way of summarizing a very complex topic and which may not be so bad by the way, because there is a notion out there that with COVID and all the relief spending that our government has provided, which some of it is certainly warranted, but, it's also felt that there are going to be downsides to this. And one of the main downsides being that the financial and investment landscape for the next generation, for our kids, will be will be dampened by all this relief spending currently. So with that in mind, transferring some to the next generation may not be a bad idea. Now for my final question on whole life insurance. And my introduction to this topic was through a book called The White Coat Investor. It's written by an emergency physician in the United States who is very knowledgeable, very well versed in a wide range of financial topics. And while a lot of the lingo in the in the book is based on the U.S. system, I, I do think that a lot of the principles do apply here. But he mentions in his book that many of the whole life insurance policies are eventually canceled by the policyholder. And that could be due to a variety of reasons. Maybe life just catches up with you and you're no longer able to readily afford the premiums or you just weren't getting the returns that you had hoped for. And he mentions that upwards of 50% of these policies are often canceled, which to me seems like a high number, but I, I wanted to ask you, based on your experience, have you found this to at all be true? Not at all. I find people who get into these contracts that have value in the long term hang on to them. Okay. And, and in fact, uh, up until four years ago, uh, when... Um, a lot of my clients would bought these contracts personally because corporations were not, you know, around and, you know, pre what 204 when you were allowed to incorporate. So from 204 onwards, we started moving these personally held policies into the corporation. So essentially it was a transfer of ownership and these physicians were getting a windfall because the fair market value of these contracts was massive and compared to, uh, what the premiums they paid into them. Yep. So they were they were able to extract money to the corporation tax free. Okay. Which was a fantastic windfall. Mm -hmm. But now I think in twenty March of twenty sixteen budget they 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 stopped that. They put an end to it. They said if you uh, sell your policy to your corporation, then you'll have to be tax honored. So it, it's basically plugged that gap. And the reason why I'm mentioning it this is that. Uh, a lot of these policies were initiated way back in the 90s and, you know, they hung on to them for 10, 15, 20 years and kept paying them. And uh, I don't see a 50 percent drop. Obviously, there are situations where financial hardship, you know, comes into play and they can't afford the premium and they walk away from the policy, you know, but it's nowhere near 50 percent. I'd say it's like less, less than 10 percent. OK, that's sure. good to know. That's quite reassuring. So my next question is probably more relevant to professionals later on in their careers. And when you look at all these insurance products, so disability insurance, life insurance, and critical illness, which I know we don't really have time to tackle today, but the total cost of all these products is not insignificant. And I'm sure one eventually reaches a stage in their career where insurance coverage is probably not as necessary. So I'm wondering, 
when is it a reasonable time to consider dropping some of these products? And the answer to this may simply be, hey, when you've reached financial independence, but perhaps there are some other considerations as well. And I'm wondering if you can just shed some light on this. Well, um, I, I look at dropping term insurance uh, when debt is gone, kids, kids are all growing up and self-sufficient, and there's enough assets uh, for the surviving spouse to live on. So term insurance over time will price you out. That's what it's designed to do. It's designed yep. to make it painful so that you're not renewing. So the insurance company is going to have to pay out a death claim. So at the end of the day, you will be terminating your term insurance policy, uh, likely, you know, 25 to 30 years out for sure. Okay. Okay. So that that's, uh, you know, at one point. Now, the, the permanent insurance policy, as we just talked about, the PAR policy, universal life policies, you're not going to cancel those because you put too much money into them. Yep. So it, it, it wouldn't be prudent to just walk away from all that premium um, and try to cash out and, and pay tax on that money and so on. So essentially you want to hang on to those for as long as you can and, and try to stick to the original strategy. Okay. Uh, in terms of disability insurance, um, as you approach retirement and you're no longer working 30 hours per week, that's the requirement of these contracts. You have to be working full time, okay. which is defined as 30 hours per week. So if you can't, May manage to work 30 hours per week, you should probably terminate the contract. Okay. Or in some situations, there are some contracts that allow conversion to long-term care, which is another topic. Mm -hmm. But that could be a worthwhile uh, topic to to look into for that individual who has the ability to, to do so. So, okay. so, yeah, eventually you're going to wind down disability, term life insurance. Uh, critical illness usually comes to an end as well. Okay. Uh, Typically, 75 is when most will come to an end. And okay. Some are, are 10 or 20 year terms, so they'll all come to an end. Okay, Joe, thank you for your candid answer on that. And finally, guys, insurance is often a daunting topic for professionals. Is there any advice that you'd like to leave our listeners with? I definitely think that there's so much value in starting this planning out when you're younger. Yep. As a young professional myself, I'm an advocate to making sure that from day one into your career that you're setting yourself up for success. So making sure that you're partnering with the right sort of advisors who can work with you and grow with you through your career so that all these decisions are, you know, made together and that you don't feel that you're left on your own to try and sort through the, like you said, insane world of insurance and finance. Uh, but taking that sort of burden on early will make the rest of your career a lot smoother um, instead of trying to play catch up when you're halfway through your career and, you know, haven't put sure. in place the right programs, for sure. For sure, Kristen. I think that is very wise advice. And now I want to take a moment to thank both of you for taking the time to be with us today. I think that you both did a fantastic job at simplifying a very complicated topic. And I think that for anybody who's taken that next step at looking at insurance policies, they can really benefit from the content that you provided. So thank you once again. Well, thank you, Yatin. We, uh, we enjoyed the opportunity to speak with you and with your listener base, and uh, we look forward to having other conversations down the road as well. Okay, so there you have it, our interview with Joe Fazio and Kristen Fazio from Professionals Insurance Center in Richmond Hill. You can Google Professionals Insurance Center and get access to their contact info. They are a very knowledgeable resource on insurance. So full disclosure, the content in this episode is so far beyond the knowledge I had when I was signing up for my policies in 2017. So if you're looking for an insurance policy, I hope the information in this episode can help guide you along the right path. Now, somebody recently asked me about the title of the podcast, and I said Beyond MD is meant to help physicians gain a deeper understanding on financial topics that will hopefully help us get ahead outside the workplace. And then it dawned on me that Beyond MD goes beyond physicians in the sense that I really believe the topics we're covering now and will in upcoming episodes should be relevant to professionals outside of medicine as well. So if you like what you're hearing, feel free to subscribe and spread the love to any medical and non-medical professionals. Remember, we are all in this together. So that's it for today. Until next time, when we talk more about our corporations, hope you can join us. Take care, everyone. Stay safe.